Uh, thank you, Simon. Please excuse my, uh, my hoarse throat, but uh, the, uh, the air in Cape Town is not uh, doing too well with me these days. Um, I can recognize some people from the audience from the presentation I did beginning of this year uh, when I was with Vanani Private Clients. So some of you may have seen the slides before, uh, although the, uh, the underlying content in the last couple of months has changed. Um, we've had a bit of, uh, let's say, turbulence uh, in this country in the last couple of months with the currency and a bit of government change and a little bit of cooking classes in the last 24 hours of some curry. So the markets have been going up and down. But when I choose uh, the stocks in my annual selection, they're done for a very specific reason. Uh, slides I'll show you very, sh very shortly indicate that I buy and hold these shares for a period of exactly 12 months. So even if my conviction changes during the course of the year, I'm, I have a, a, enough confidence in my, in my selection to hold them for exactly 12 months. In many cases, they, they, they tend to work out. Uh, every year, one is generally a, a bum steer. Uh, I can't be that lucky year after year. This is now the fifth year I've been doing this. Uh, I did it for one simple reason. For many years, I was a, I was a salesman. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, and then I went into equity sales. Uh, I've run money for Sanlam, and, but my, my initial career was in equity research, working for Standard Bank back in 1996, when they recruited me from London uh, to join their, their desk. So I'm much older than I look. Um, so when I came back into the institutional stockbroking market about five years ago, I had to reestablish my name from a salesman when I left as the country's second best salesman back into research. And I've been covering small to mid caps for the last 20 years. Uh, so that was, the, that was the area that I was known for. So I thought I'd start uh, resurrecting an, an old brand called Small Talk Daily. And the wonders of social media, which I absolutely adore, and it gets me into terrible trouble, particularly with companies that I, uh, that I tend to criticize. Um, I've, I've uh, managed to get my opinion across on quite a concise basis. So anyone that uh, follows me on social media or who wants to, it's at Small Talk Daily. I'm sure you'll get a, uh, a lot of information during the course of the day uh, because I tweet on a regular basis. As I said to Simon earlier, today, for example, I got up quite early. I was at Advertech first thing in the morning. Then I went to Grand Parade for their results. Then there was a Meta conference call. I had lunch with Choppies. I've just spoken to Peter Armitage of Anchor Capital, whose results have just come out. Uh, tomorrow I'm seeing Pete again for Anchor. Um, so there's always things going on in my life. So without any further ado, um, I'll go straight into my top five of 2016. The year started very well. In the first probably week or two of that selection came out on January the 11th, many of the stocks had a good run. But you know, circumstances being as they may with the stock market, particularly uh, in the small to mid cap arena where resources have done very well so far this year, and the benchmark indices that I, tracked, I track have soared because they're full of gold and other precious metal counters. Uh, whereas the industrial counters I actually cover have actually had a very negative scenario. But if I move in, the usual disclaimer, which I have to put in, even though I don't really care that much about legal stuff and compliance. And what I said on, on, uh, in early January, last year was an extremely good year. I had 51% uh, return last year, which is one of the best I've had in the last four years. Uh, but past performance is never a, a guide to future performance. And uh, even though I think that uh, this year's selection at some point uh, will pan out quite nicely, uh, so far I'm down about 5% for the year to date. So I actually, when I chose these stocks for the Christmas, I actually meet with about 15 uh, small to mid cap companies, which I really, truly believe could do well in the course of one year. I meet every CEO, and then I whittle it down to a top 10. I then have lunch or coffee with every one of those CEOs to say, right, why should I choose you in my top five for the following year? And then I whittle it down to a top five, although in this year's selection, it was actually a top six. And because I expected this year to be a very difficult stock market, with currencies, government issues, a weak economy, global issues, et cetera, et cetera. There were swathes of stocks that I cover that I actually had to leave out because I didn't expect the underlying performance from those counters to actually justify their selection. So it will be down even further. So we all know what's going on with the drought, so many of my food stocks couldn't go in. We all know about rand weakness. That also had an impact on, on certain counters. Rising interest rates, as we saw again today, rates have gone up. Uh, all of these little factors, you know, led me to distill a very narrow band of stocks, primarily which I believe this year will have special situations. When I, use that, when I use that term, it means there's deals coming, there's unbundlings coming, there's good earnings coming, or there's some form of sentiment or transaction change, which I believe will occur this year, which hopefully will spur the share price higher. So far, only one of my top five has actually had that type of growth, which is Signia. Uh, but I'll explain the others and to see uh, what the year will, will hold. So there's my last four years to date. Again, I do this to uh, 
uh, just to prove to my institutional clients that uh, this former ex-engineer and former salesman actually does know what he's doing uh, occasionally, but I do tend to make, it, uh, m make most of it up. Um, my 2015 selection, uh, which gained my performance, again, was a fairly mixed bag. Uh, CIL, the top one, is a stock I've been covering for the last uh, probably seven or eight years. I actually listed the company. Uh, Torrey Industries, again, is a stock that I've had for a couple of years. It's been a very poor performer uh, so far this year. Cura Holdings, again, is a stock that I've been involved in uh, from 1 Rand 78 uh, when it was part of Paladin Capital uh, inside PSG. It's a stock that I'm very, very fond of. I dropped it uh, in 2016. It was at 59 Rand 99. I really couldn't see any more growth coming from that stock. It's now back at 40 bucks. Um, Anchor Capital is a stock that I know extremely well. Uh, my former boss, uh, Peter Armitage, um, actually started that company, and uh, I was involved uh, even before the listing. And at 2 Rand, uh, when the stock was uh, listed a couple of years ago, I came out with a very bold price target, saying I believe the stock would trade at 20 Rand within three years. It got there literally in 18 months. And then uh, lastly, Quantum Foods, a stock that I've, uh, uh, I follow quite closely. Um, it had a very good start of the year. I mean, as the drought hit and the maize price rocketed and the perception that Quantum Foods would get uh, sidelined uh, because of higher input costs, the stock sank. But Quantum Foods doesn't really have much of an impact uh, from a higher maize price. It's, it's hedged and it's no longer in poultry. Uh, but the market doesn't really care what Quantum does. And it's very difficult to persuade my institutional clients to buy a stock where they believe uh, but the higher maize price will impact profits. So I left it out. So it wasn't, it wasn't a bad year. I still, like, I still like all of the stocks, but for, for different reasons. And as I went back to you earlier, I hold these stocks for one whole year. Uh, as you can see there, the year always starts off, and it has a bit of a tail towards the end. There's my two, four, 2014 selection. Again, not a bad year. Again, there's always a couple of standout stocks every year that, uh, that really push uh, my performance. Last year it was Torre and ConvergeNet, which became Stellar Capital. Same thing, you have to hold the stocks for a year because they start to pick up. Um, anybody that bought the top five back in June had a very good return. Again, my 2013 selection, again, a couple of very familiar names um, in that little list. And again, you have to hold the stock or the portfolio for an entire year because it takes time in many instances for the stories that I believe in to actually develop. Um, my 2012 selection, again, a, a flavor uh, of uh, what I've chosen. Again, a couple of very familiar names like Kuro and, uh, and CIL. So what happened last year and why did I drop certain counters and what did I put in? And for utter transparency, uh, not that I have to, but for my clients, I publish twice a year what I actually own. All my pension funds are independently managed by Sandlam in a glacier wrap fund. And as such, I currently own Signia, Tor, Stella Capital, Astoria, and CIL. So there's no need for me to hide behind anything. I tell people honestly what I own. Because if, if my money is in these stocks, uh, it's probably good enough for my clients because I'm putting my own skin in the game. Uh, so last year's selection, uh, CIL, a stock that I'm, uh, I'm very close to, and Rel Gamzu, the CEO, and I probably chat at least once a week. Uh, this is the company that I listed probably back in 2006, 2007 as a construction materials company involved in making tiles for roofs and bricks and aggregates. And then in the height of a Lehman Brothers crisis in 2007-2008, I uh, bought one of Africa's best power infrastructure businesses called Conco for about 600 million rand. It raised the money from a combination of paper and a very large loan from, a world, from a, one of the world's richest men, a Saudi prince. Uh, that stock has done fantastically well uh, for me for the last five years and continues to do extremely well. Uh, I have a slide on that going forward. Um, the second one, Kura Holdings, again, a stock that I've been following probably, probably for, for the last 10 years. Uh, I'm very fond of the private education market in this sector. I know there's a couple of people in the audience that uh, uh, I questioned last time or questioned me on private education and why I'm very fond of it. But in my case, I have no children. Uh, but the market is dynamic. There's good underlying demand. And as Advertech told me this morning and Kuro two weeks ago, there's inherent growth in the demand for affordable, quality private education in this marketplace as long as the government system continues to be sort of lackluster. Toro Industries is a stock that I've been involved in since 30 cents a share. Uh, it was a, a formerly a crane business called SA French, and I went along to kick the tires, and I liked what I saw with a young financier involved in, in that company with a little bit of a backing from Christo Visa, and that stock at its height hit a high of 5 Rand 50. Uh, it's, it's halved since then, and it's been a very poor performer in my 2016 uh, um, selection. I'm really not fussed. 
uh, there are specific reasons why I chose uh, the stocks in my 2016 uh, portfolio, and Tor was put back in, even though it's been a poor performer. I'll explain why I still like it going forward. Anchor Capital, again, many of you may know uh, Peter Armitage's company, it's done fantastically well. Earnings came out probably a couple of hours ago. Uh, he showed growth year on year. Uh, nearly, I think he earned 55 cents a share, paid 26 cents in dividend. And uh, assets under management in the last 12 months have grown from 18 billion rand to 40 billion. And the 2006 16 prospect statement, which I read, uh, was extremely upbeat. And he's presenting in Cape Town tomorrow. And then lastly, Quantum Foods, a company that was spun out, spun out from Pioneer Foods, holding all their agricultural interests. A company that I think has significant upside value. Uh, it has a net asset value of 6 rand 50 a share. Half its market value is currently in cash. And there's a perception uh, in the marketplace that it's, it's wholly reliant on either poultry or maize. That's not exactly true. They're contract growers for Sovereign and for Astral Foods. There's a cost plus basis, so there's no real uh, um, uh, impact to the higher maize price. They just pass it on. And then on the actual maize price, they've got a very, very good hedging policy. And because they're coastal, they can buy from overseas. So it's a stock currently at about three rand, which I'm still very, very fond of. So my top five of 2016. I should have a drum roll right now. Um, so here we go. Uh, many stocks uh, are much the same. CIL, Torre, Stella Capital, Signia, Astoria, and Santova. I've got a little glass of water here. I updated these slides as of yesterday. Um, as you can see, it's been a very mixed bag. The underlying indices you know, are up you know, 13% and just under 10%, predominantly resources driven. Uh, the industrial counters within these two benchmarks have had a terrible performance. Uh, I actually stripped out uh, the resources, if you can, from that, and I'd actually be on par um, if, uh, if uh, resources were excluded. So once again, they're my top five, but I'm actually saying it's a top six because Tor Industries and Stellar Capital, I think, are interlinked because Stellar Capital owns about 34% of Tor Industries. So I'm using them as, as one underlying business. So we'll go straight in. CIL, as its shortened name, uh, is a stock that I've been involved in, as I said, for many, many years. Uh, it's a stock that in the last few months has had a substantial derating uh, for one simple reason, misperception. One of, a, one of CIL's largest businesses based in Angola uh, reprocesses waste from the oil industry. So basically, if you're an offshore driller drilling for oil uh, on a platform, you create waste. Uh, environmental waste, drilling waste, human waste, any form of rubbish needs to be taken off the platform, reprocessed, and disposed of in, in a responsible manner. Um, because of the price of oil internationally, as we've all seen, has slumped, there was a perception in the marketplace that AES inside CIL would have a significant slump in profits. That simply hasn't happened. In the last set of results uh, to August, they actually showed an, a significant increase year on year in their numbers. Because what the market has simply failed to understand is as long as they keep on drilling, for every single barrel of oil that is drilled in Angola, waste needs to be reprocessed. Underlying production in Angola has gone up year on year. So if they're producing more oil, more waste is produced. More waste needs to be reprocessed and disposed of. And the single biggest change here is on the 1st of January, the Angolan government uh, implemented legislation which meant that oil companies had to dispose of every single scrap of waste they produce on a daily basis. Up until the, first, up until the 31st of December, they could let 5% of that waste suddenly go missing in the environment, in the ocean, on land, and nobody cared. They're now globally compliant, and AES inside CIL, which is a third of profits, is doing remarkably well. And this company is 60% rand hedged. So we look at the key drivers of CIL. You've got an offshore business, 60% rand hedge. You've got power infrastructure, which is a significant growth demand in Africa, probably for the next 20 years. Everybody's putting a new, into new power capacity. Renewables in this country and infrastructure inside Africa. We've got a building materials side, which is less than 20% of profits. And all in all, I'm expecting results to come out uh, in August to be at least 25% up year on year. It's a February interim, and results uh, for this year will be out probably the first or second week of April, and I'm expecting a very, very positive trading update. This stock, just about here, um, hit about 24 rand, and I've been calling this stock a buy for quite some time. And once the market suddenly realized that the underlying prospects inside this company 
uh, were actually quite good. It rallied quite sharply. We're now back at about 29 Rand. Um, I value the stock on a one year view of 38 Rand. Uh, this has got prospects which you can put away in, your any, in any pension fund on a one, three, five, ten year time perspective. The CEO is a friend of mine. Um, he's probably one of the best CEOs I've, I've dealt with. He knows his business like the back of his hand. And he's probably one of the, the most, I'd say, in terms of integrity, not once in the nine years I've dealt with this guy has he ever misled me or ever deviated from the story. And, uh, you know, when you're buying a company, you're buying management and you're buying quality. And if management is as good as the underlying prospects, then I'm very happy. So there's CIL. Signia, uh, a very contentious um, selection for me because I had Anchor in last year at about uh, 7 Rand 15 and it more than doubled. So I, I thought, well, I can't put Anchor in again because it hit a high of 1840 when I did this selection on the 11th of January. And I really believed that going forward, even though the company had great prospects, at 1840 just looked too expensive. I put a sell in the stock and I, say, I said I'd buy it back at around 14 Rand. It hit 1375 today. And on my Twitter account, I said my pension fund is buying back Anchor as we speak. Um, so I put Signia in its place because I always like to have some form of growth uh, financial stock uh, in the system. Signia is a company that I was involved in in the listing last year. It listed on the 14th of October uh, at about 8 Rand 40. And uh, that date was chosen for a very specific reason uh, because the, the lady that founded and runs this business, it just happens to be her birthday. So she, she thought she'd list her company on her birthday. Uh, she had a very, very good birthday present. The stock doubled on the first, on the first day. So she became a multi billionaireess uh, on the 14th of, uh, of October. Since I made the call at uh, 1344, the stock is now hitting uh, uh, a new high. It closed this evening at 17 Rand. I had an 18 Rand price target at the end of the year, so there isn't much to go uh, until I get to my price target. It's been the single best performer in my portfolio so far this year. So what's driving the stock? It's a combination of growth in, growth in assets under management. Um, she's moved into a very aggressive new area of industry called umbrella funds. Government legislation is forcing um, pension funds to consolidate. When they consolidate, they, uh, trustees want all their assets to be in one simple area. They're called umbrellas. And there's four big umbrella fund providers in this country. And Anchor is going to, sorry, Signia is going to become the fifth. She bought a very small business called Galette, which has five billion rand under management. And uh, post-April, um, there'll be a massive rollout of umbrella funds in this country. And she's expecting to take significant market share. There are also, there are also whispers of major transactions uh, currently bubbling under the surface. So I think post-Easter, um, the share price strength that you have seen uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few months in this, uh, in this company will actually lead to concrete results. Um, it's a company that I know extremely well. Uh, I probably speak to the, uh, the CEO at least once a week. And again, I think it's a March interim period. I think it'll be a very positive trading update. And it's a stock that I think, again, you could put in your pension fund and lock away for many years. Um, Machter, who founded this company, is, is, a, is a very impressive, very driven woman. Uh, I call her the dame, because not, not because she's, a, she's, a, she's some old dame, because she's, she's actually driven. She wants to create a, a sizable, dynamic, large financial services business. And I think so far she's, she's done extremely well. Uh, I'm expecting assets under management as of the end of March to have grown from about 139 billion to about 160 billion, even in these turbulent times. So at, uh, at 17 Rand, it's had a good run, uh, but I still think it'll hit my uh, 18 Rand target, I think sooner rather than later. Stellar Capital, uh, been one of my laggards uh, in the fund so far. I chose the stock at about 2 Rand 25, it's now trading at 1 Rand 83. Uh, there's a number of strategic reasons why the stock has been weak in the last, uh, in the last few weeks. One of them has been valuation. Um, unbeknown to many people, including myself, uh, nobody knew this. Uh, inside the valuation for Stellar Capital were a number of assumptions regarding the valuation it placed on its own assets. It has a 34% stake in Tor Industries. It has a, it has a financial services arm called Cadiz, uh, stakes in IT companies and a big lump of cash, about a billion rand. Uh, when they released their results about three weeks ago, um, when you do a net asset value calculation in any business, you put in what the current market value is for any stock to give you the sum of the parts. That's the normal uh, rule of thumb. Stellar Capital thought they'd put in the last price they paid for Tor Industries in their books, which was 5 Rand 20. So the underlying NAV of this company was fundamentally overvalued, and the share price got slammed. Um, I had a meeting with the, with the CEO, who happens to be the CEO of Tor Industries as well. And uh, let's just say it was less than kind uh, regarding his, uh, his underlying assumptions. However, this company, as I've written about in the last 
12, 24 months, has a sprinkling of gold dust hidden away because the magic name of Christo Visa is actually involved being a significant owner of this company. Now, anyone who's followed Christo Visa over the last 10 or 20 years uh, with PEP and ShopRite, amongst others, has made a great deal of money. So why would one of the country's richest men get involved in a company with a market valuation of probably 2 billion rand? Um, the answer is simple. He is actually rolling in many of his own assets into this company, and it's my personal belief uh, in conjunction with Charles Pettit, who's the young financier running this business, that he wants to emulate Stellar Capital to be a miniature version of Breit. So it'll end up owning equity stakes in a number of listed entities and operational assets as well going forward. So what we're seeing right now is a company in flux. The portfolio is being cleaned up. The market is very unsure where it's going because there's very little disclosure. Um, and unless you actually follow the company closely, and I mean sometimes day by day, uh, the CEO actually uh, sent me a message earlier. Uh, we were chit-chatting about something. Um, you know, it's a stock that you can easily either overlook or dismiss because it is a very volatile business. So why do I think this company is one to keep an eye on? Firstly, because the magic visa name. Assets are being injected. Secondly, there's cash in the balance sheet. We raised a billion rand uh, in equity and perpetual preps uh, late last year. It has a stake in Tor Industries, which is currently worth half uh, its, uh, its underlying value. But I think in due course, they'll take that asset out and they'll own it 100%. And this is a deal-driven company. There's a classic old-fashioned 80s term called roll-up conglomerate, where companies use paper or transactions or structures to buy other companies to roll them up to make a bigger business. This is a classic roll-up. And I think going forward, uh, management, which are significant shareholders, including the CEO, want this business to succeed. So it is speculative. It's not a stock I'd put in Granny's portfolio. Uh, but I think for anybody who's looking to uh, add some spice uh, to a, to a, to a, a, a fund, uh, I'd certainly put a small holding of stellar capital in. And I'm, I'm, I've got a very bold target of a free rand 50. And at the beginning of this year, as a couple of people in the audience uh, heard me beginning of the year, I think this stock will be significantly higher at the end of the year than it was beginning of the year because most of the deals are only going to happen from June onwards. So I, I chose it early, but I chose it for a reason. It's a special situation where things are going to happen at a set time frame. Tour Industries, uh, it's been particularly weak in my portfolio this year, but has, as has the entire sector. Uh, the ELB results which came out today were absolutely dreadful, and the share price fell by 15%. Uh, Invicta, uh, which is a, a much bigger version of Tour Industries, has more than halved uh, in the last 12 months. And because Tor Industries is involved in the mining and infrastructure sector, uh, as, well, as well as some industrial areas, there's, there's a perception out there that it's been dragged into the same mire uh, as many other counters in the sector. Uh, interim results that came out a couple of weeks ago only showed a 5% rise uh, in, uh, in initial numbers to 15 cents a share. Uh, my forecast of the entire year is 38 cents. That might be a touch high, uh, given what's going on. But they will show significant growth in the second half. And I think at 2.85, rand uh, 85, 295, uh, when our prices yesterday close at 275 today. Uh, the stock is trading at a P of around 8. So there's a two simple reasons why I think this stock could be a, a special situation. Firstly, if the underlying earnings do deliver, as I expect, to the June year end, the stock will be trading on a, on a low P valuation. Now, in my, in my life, in the 20 years I've been covering small caps, small caps don't generally trade on low PEs for too long. At some point, they start to recover. So this company on a, on a P of around 8 uh, is looking interesting. Secondly, after the 27th of April is a very key date in this company's life. When Stellar Capital, which I said earlier, bought uh, a stake in Tor Industries, the highest price they paid was 5 Rand 19. Under the takeover rules in this country, if you were to make a, a bid for the company six months Within six months of paying the last deal that you did with 519, you'd have to offer every shareholder the same price, which is 519. So why would you right now take out a company when you're having to pay 5 Rand 19 when it's currently trading at 2 Rand 75 to, let's call it, 3 Rand? You'd be mad to. That exemption runs out on the 27th of April. So that's a key date. So I'm assuming at some point that if the market doesn't re-rate Tor Industries, Stellar Capital will buy minorities. They only have to take their stake from 34% to 55 to get complete control because the empowerment, empowerment parties, which is basically Sabvest, Mine Workers Pension Fund and Safika, will follow their rights and move into, uh, into uh, Stellar Capital as well. So I think that the take-up price of this stock will be north of 4 rand a share. So at some point, I'm not quite sure when, 
Uh, I think this stock is going to have a nice run, but it might, again, not be until after June. So it's one I'm certainly keeping an eye on. Santova, uh, it's a new stock in my portfolio. I haven't covered it before. Um, we have an extremely good transport analyst working for Vanoni Securities called Arnold Weberholf, uh, who covers the entire sector. But at a market value of 650 million rand, it was too small for him to cover. So in the middle of last year, two of my larger institutional clients asked me to kick the tires and do a complete uh, valuation of a company and meet management, which I did. And for those that don't know the stock, uh, it's basically a Durban-based transport and logistics company, but generally involved in, in supply chain management, and they have a very good software operation as well. But the key thing I liked about this business is firstly growing Rand Hedge operations. It has operations in Europe, the Far East, in the States, and uh, in East and West Africa. And the share price, as you can see, has had a nice little run uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few months on the back of the acquisitions, again, in the offshore arena. Profits in the period last year were 31 cents, were up 48%, of which 60% came from offshore. So why do I think this little, little company could attract the attention of the wider market? Because as I said to you earlier, my main role is to deal with institutional clients. When I did this roadshow on the 12th of January to my larger clients, Coronation, Sanlam, Metropolitan, Investec, Alan Gray, amongst others, not one single fund manager that I spoke to, managing over a trillion rand of funds, had ever heard of this stock. So at some point, when this company starts making good money and it's now trading on a P of around 15 or 16 and results are due literally in the next few weeks, um, it might catch the imagination of the small, cap the small cap fund manager looking for the next growth story. And I think this could be it. And I say my words very carefully because currently I'm the only analyst that covers this stock. Uh, there's no research, there's no coverage. Uh, there's no marketing, and the underlying team that runs the business doesn't do anything. They don't hold lunches, they do nothing. So at some point, when we deliver good results with a little bit of marketing, a little bit of research, and you know how the game works, this stock will actually catch the imagination of the market. And that's why I chose it at 4 rand 80, but with market turbulence, it's now come back to about 4 bucks. And at 4 rand, for anybody that follows technical analysis, I really don't because I'm not that clever. Uh, that little triangle thingy there, means there could be a little, little breakout coming. Who knows? But it's a stock that I'm very fond of, uh, and I think that my six rand target might seem a bit aggressive from four rand, but uh, its underlying prospects remain sound. I met with the underlying CEO and his FD about two weeks ago in Johannesburg, and the story they gave me was actually quite compelling. And I'll give you one example as to why I think this stock in due course could catch the imagination of my larger clients. Many, many years ago, when I listed a small school company, or was involved with a small school company called Kuro Holdings, uh, listed at four rand a share. I tried for years to get my larger clients to buy a stake in that business. They wouldn't touch it. They'd never heard of it, and who were these people, and what do they do, and we can't be bothered, and it's too much like hard work. And from four rand, it went up and up and up and up. It delivered good earnings, and suddenly at 17 rand 60, with a market valuation of several billion rand from, your, from your initial you know, small market value, I got my first major client to buy six million shares. So in many cases, fund managers have to be comfortable with a stock before they can actually buy it. And that comes with history, track record, and scale. Currently at a 650 rand market value, it's actually too small for most fund managers to buy. Because if Coronation were to say to me right now, Anthony, we love the stock, buys 50 million rands worth, I couldn't do it. It simply isn't the stock available to do this deal. So it's growing into itself, it, but it's a perfect stock for the smaller boutique, clients and for private clients. So I'd certainly watch this one very closely going forward. And then my last stock, which was again was very contentious, Astoria. When I chose this um, beginning of the year, it was trading at about 17 Rand 44, and it listed last October at about 14 Rand 23. Uh, basically, it has a JC listing and a Mauritian listing, and listed at one US dollar. So back in the day, uh, before all the, uh, the shenanigans happened, one US dollar was worth 14 rand 23. Uh, it then went to north of 17 rand, and everybody thought we have to get our money offshore. But uh, for those that aren't lucky enough to have uh, access to uh, financial advisors and all, the, and all the, the gubbings you need to take money offshore, the easiest way was to buy a stock on the JSE, which has complete offshore holdings, 60% in equity, 20% in private equity, and 20% in country funds. So for the man in the street, who perhaps doesn't have the wherewithal at all to actually send his money offshore and replicate this fund, you can simply, on the JSE, buy Astoria and get 100% Rand Hedge. 
the other little trick that, uh, that this company did was for institutions that were at their maximum offshore allowance, they were allowed to buy Astoria to actually increase their holdings above 25% completely legitimately. So it was a wonderful little, little scheme. So this company, Astoria, is actually run by Anchor Capital. So um, Astoria uh, is actually uh, named after a little pink guest house in PE with fading paint, uh, where my good friend Peter Armitage drove past once. And uh, so it's called Astoria. I did tell him it's a good job he didn't drive past Mavericks or Teasers. <laughs> Might have had a different name. So uh, if the stock's come down since then, we're now trading at about 15 Rand 65 and some change. Um, unless you truly be believe that this country going forward, uh, Iran is going to have a significant period of strength, which may or may not happen, depending on government policy and, and what's going on. Um, I always recommend that clients, particularly private clients, have a certain proportion of their assets offshore for RAND hedge protection. And this is one of the easiest and simplest ways to do that. So I chose it because the theme of this fund this year, my top five, was capital preservation and some capital growth. And I assumed that Astoria was a good store of capital. Uh, currently, it's, uh, it's losing me money, but the year is still quite young. And who knows where the Rand dollar will be at the end of the year. And then my famous little black book, uh, for those that know me, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of electronic uh, uh, gaz gadgets and gizmos because I tend to break them or lose them. So I have, a, I have an old-fashioned counter book where I write lots of notes and I stick things in and it's, and it's stuffed full of, uh, of ideas. So anybody who finds my little black book generally has a, a wealth of information. So what I said at the beginning of, the beginning of this year, uh, my, my great ideas for the year was PSG Group. Uh, it raised a significant lump of money last year, 2 Rand 45, a premium to some of the parts. And I said there is no way that I would pay a 24% premium to buy a stock when I can replicate most of this portfolio in the stock market. I can buy Kuro, I can buy Zeta, I can buy PSG Consult, I can buy Capitech. Why should I pay a 24% premium to buy a company where I can buy much of the underlying. And I thought the share price would weaken, and it did. Uh, it's now back to about 1 Rand 80, 1 Rand 90. And it's gone from a 24% premium to, as of yesterday, uh, a 5% discount. So I think the underlying constituents are very attractive, but it's still a stock. But a 5% discount, I think, still has perhaps some downside value. Because traditionally, PSG trades between an 8 and a 13% discount. So to me, it's a good company, great long-term value, but currently looking a little bit too expensive. Now, Zeta Investments is a stock that I've been hammering for the last six months for one simple reason. Its single largest asset is Pioneer Foods. Now, we all know that food price inflation in this country, the maize price, has taken a drubbing uh, in the last 12 months. It's cost, it costs us more to buy our basic groceries. And in terms, of, in terms of maize and wheat, the underlying input costs into manufacturers have risen dramatically in the last 12 months. So if food companies are having to pay more to actually make the food that we eat, and they can't pass that cost on to the likes of you and me because we're all a little bit stretched in our pockets. Margins start to erode and profits start to weaken. And Pioneer Foods had exactly that. Its share price has more than halved in the last uh, 12 months. And if your single largest investment, which makes up literally your entire portfolio, has halved, why should your business in terms of Zida actually hold up? At one point, this stock fell to a 50% discount of some of the parts. And I'm saying until we actually see some form of recovery uh, in the food dynamics in this country in terms of lower wheat price, a lower maize price, and a, a slightly better consumer environment, there is no reason whatsoever to currently buy zero investments. You know, the discount companies are 27% discounts to some of the parts, which might sound attractive. Uh, it probably does, but there's no reason to own this thing because I think it'll get cheaper. Uh, and then lastly, the food sector. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was very positive in the food sector, and I was calling the poultry stocks and most of the food companies significantly higher, and they had a very good run. And then the drought happened, and then there was no maize crop, and the wheat price more than doubled. Uh, and uh, the entire sector so far has had a terrible, terrible 2016. Uh, we've had a profit warning from Astral Foods, we've, had, we've got shenanigans from Sovereign, we've seen, we've seen Pioneer Foods halve, we've seen Tiger Brands sell off their Nigerian operations for like nothing, having spent billions of rands in their operation. So the food sector is an area uh, that I continue to favor longer term, but in a 12-month view, it's one that I'd keep away from, and it's so far has been the right call. Um, and then Torre Industries, as I mentioned earlier, having, with the share price having nearly halved on the back of a, a number of uh, extraneous market, market uh, influences, and with the stellar capital owning just under 34%, I think at some, at some point, it'll either get taken out at a premium, or it might re-rate as earnings start to deliver. And for those who want to follow me on, uh, on social media, at Small Talk Daily. Yes. 
Well, I said I met with Glenn in Joburg uh, a good two weeks ago uh, for other reasons. Uh, in my life, there are lots of other reasons and things that I get involved in, because I used to run a corporate broking division of my company as well. Um, the key area for Santova is the synergies between all the branches it's bought. So currently it has a number of operations, for example, in Hamburg and in Western East Africa, in London, in Australia. And as those businesses start to integrate and speak to each other, the supply chain and the logistics involved in moving things around the world becomes easier. So they actually make things easier for a company. And one of the examples he gave me is, I'm Edgar's. I want to buy handbags for my stores. So in the old days, you would go to China, you would, you would run around looking at manufacturers to go buy handbags. Then you would buy 100,000 handbags. You'd then have to find them, ship them somewhere, pack them, box them, deliver them. They'd arrive in this country, they'd have to clear customs, VAT, blah, blah, blah. Then they'd have to go to a depot, a distribution, and they'd have to be, there's lots of steps in actually doing something. So what they do, they say, Edgar's, we'll do all that for you. Tell us what color handbag you want in the style. We will find the handbags, we will pack them, box them, ship them, do all the, all the, all the paperwork, all the logistics, all the taxes, all the VAT, and we'll drop them off at your store. And, you, and you're going to say, wow, that's fantastic. It saves me time and saves me money. And that's what they do. Their job is to make companies' lives easier in terms of supply chain dynamics, in terms of finding a product and delivering it to the store. And as more companies want to make their lives easier, which most companies now want to do, Santova, as a specialist in that area, should do a lot better. And I think the trading up that you're going to, you're going to be seeing, let's just say the next few weeks, I think will be quite good. Well, in Tor's case, it has, it has minimal impact because they aren't really involved in the oil services sector. Uh, it's more of a mining sector. In CIL's case, as I, as I said to you earlier, there was a misconception uh, that the, the lower oil price would mean there'd be lower earnings coming from a, from a, from a waste division. But as, I, as I've been explaining to the market for months, as long as they keep pumping and they keep drilling, there's waste to be reprocessed. And globally, um, we all know that most countries that are dependent on oil generally tend to pump more uh, when times are tough because they have, a, they, have a, they have a budget to make up. So in Angola's case, they're actually pumping more oil year on year to, make, to try and make up a budget of shortfall. Now, there's all this misconception that you can't get dollars out of Angola. It's hit companies like NASPERS, uh, Data Tech, amongst others. But the oil sector is different. Under Angolan law, and particularly Sonogol, which is a very wealthy, powerful oil company that runs the entire economy, Anyone involved in the oil industry can follow a set process, and you can take money out of Angola if you follow a set process. Now, it's, exactly, it's not exactly easy, but CIL, uh, since it's owned AES, has set up all the protocols to take money out. And as I've written on many, many occasions, they bought their stake. About four years ago, they paid 130 million rand for a 30.5% stake. Last year, AES made 86 million rand in profit. So it's been a fairly good buy so far. Uh, that stake is now worth 1.8 billion rand if it were to be sold on the open market. Uh, what is not commonly known, which I've written about in, in my notes, uh, because I follow the company very closely, and for my sin, I have been to Angola and seen their operations, so I'm not just making this stuff up. In the last seven months, CIL has taken out $7.3 million from Angola. So times that by 15, it's good money. Uh, but the market doesn't care. They just see problems in Angola, you can't get dollars, the oil price is low, let's just sell the stock. Because you have to follow a stock very closely. Uh, as Simon knows, for, for anyone that covers a small cap sector, you just can't look at results twice a year. You literally have to be on top of companies every single day. Scraps of information, nuances, tiny tidbits can make the biggest difference when it comes to valuing and analyzing a company. And in CIL's case, as I said earlier, I probably speak to the CEO at least once a week. I have to, because you have to keep on top of the game. And if the market looks at a company and you have an analyst working at the large institutions that perhaps only occasionally looks at these stocks and then only reacts to bad news because they don't know the nuances, things get sold off. And CIL is a classic stock that's been sold off due to misconception. And the last time this happened was about a year ago when the stock was sold off from 36 Rand down to 28 because they thought the same thing would happen, that a lower oil price would hit profits. Once the AES numbers were, were released, the stock jumped 16% in three days after results. And I'm predicting the same thing will happen again this year. Uh, what about Rolfs? Uh, Rolfs is a company that I'm very fond of. It's a very small little company uh, involved in food chemicals, water chemicals, uh, amongst other things. The stock's been beaten down heavily. Uh, at one point, you could have bought the stock at 6.50, then it fell to about 2.50. It's now back to about 2.75. Uh, 
I uh, actually had lunch last week with the CEO uh, called Lizette Lynch, uh, and uh, she gave a very good update. This is a company that had very, very good interim results. Uh, full year results should be, a, should be around, to June, should be around maybe 50 cents a share, and the stock's trading at 2.75. So this is a classic small little stock, market valuation 450 million rand, involved in specialty niche chemicals, uh, reasonably high margins, but because it's small and nobody owns it and nobody covers it apart from me, it's difficult for an institution to actually get to grips with this business because why should you actually risk your time and your effort covering a small company? So if you think of it logically, I'm Old Mutual, I'm looking after 500 billion rand why would I get one of my analysts or one of my portfolio managers to spend a couple of days researching a small little company which I might only be able to buy a five or 10 million rand stake in? It's not worth my time. So in many cases, these small little companies get completely overlooked, not because they aren't good, because they're too small, which means that small funds or private clients have a chance to pick up these great little gems on P's of five and sixes and sit back and wait. And Rolfs is a classic story that at some point, this little business with a, with, a, with a good track record, improving earnings, trading on a P of sub five, probably five is a, is a round number, at some point will probably re-rate quite sharply. Uh, and I think the stock's worth four rand 50. It's now trading at 275. Then the Insta's finally arrived. Yes, they... and it's too late. <coughs> it's too late. Well, the income is I beg your pardon? The income is uh, It's 20%, they've got 20% offshore. As always, massive thanks to Anthony Clark for his time.